Welcome everyone to Goodweave and Studio M's joint event, COVID-19 and child labor, new challenges and steps to ensure protections for at-risk populations and global supply chains. My name is Nina Smith. I'm the CEO of Goodweave International, and uh, we're the leading global nonprofit organization working to end child labor in global supply chains. We've organized this virtual gathering in honor of World Day Against Child Labor. And for those not familiar, World Day was launched by the International Labor Organization 18 years ago to bring focus and momentum to the movement to end child labor. While we've seen a reduction in child labor prevalence by more than 30% since then, still one in 10 children are in child labor around the world. As a result of the pandemic, we've all witnessed massive global supply chain disruptions happening around the world, from lack of availability of consumer goods to seeing entire sectors like the fashion industry in massive upheaval. Most significantly, these disruptions mean that millions of people around the world are out of work. And as a result, experts believe millions of children could be pushed into labor. At Goodweave, we've also seen on the ground that tens of thousands of migrant workers in South Asia are leaving carpet, home textile, and apparel factories and, uh, and small workshops also for their home villages. Their work has dried up and they can't afford to pay rent or even food. Many are starving while moving on foot, in some cases as far as a thousand kilometers back to their home villages. Others were trapped in place in company housing when the lockdowns went into force. Many urgently need our help and we've temporarily shifted our core work at Goodweave from investigating and cleaning up supply chains to delivering relief to workers and families. And we're facilitating e-learning for children in our education programs and much more. During today's event, we'll be discussing what's happening on the ground to workers and children as supply chains have ground to a halt, as well as some of the initiatives underway to hold back the potential tide of exploitation. We're fortunate here to have with us some of the most talented social change communicators and the world's leading experts on child labor and global supply chains to lead us through a conversation on how COVID-19 um, is and will impact children and workers and what governments, businesses, civil society, and consumers can do to ensure human rights aren't compromised. Before we begin, I want to share a few uh, logistical items. So we're recording this conversation and it will be published online publicly shortly after the meeting is over. All attendees will be muted and your video is turned off throughout this event. Uh, we also encourage audience members to submit uh, questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of our panel discussion, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, you are also welcome to use the chat function on the right side of your screen to share your impressions of Studio M's new film that we'll be screening very shortly. Um, and all of the panelists and attendees will see your chat. Today we have audience members from all over the world, from Hong Kong to London, Kathmandu to Los Angeles, Delhi to Washington, and we just want to express our gratitude to you for being with us. Um, and we welcome you to share where you're from in the chat box. It's really, um, to us, an unprecedented time to be coming together from so many corners of the world. Our audience of more than 350 people represent corporate representatives, donors, both private and government, civil society organizations, and interested individuals. And we really do need all of you with us in our collective fight to end child labor. So thank you again for being here. My hope for this conversation is that um, genuinely in the name of humanity that we all commit to taking a stronger stand against child labor and, um, and also for marginalized worker communities around the world. Um, we welcome you to share your hopes for this event as well in the chat box. And um, now we'll get started with the, uh, the core of the event. For starters, I'm honored to introduce our partners at Studio M, Matt Porteous and Will Jack Robinson. We've had the good fortune to collaborate with Studio M to document the work of Goodweave on the ground in South Asia. And earlier this year, just before uh, the lockdown took place in South Asia, Matt, Will and I were in India and Nepal, and that trip led to an inspirational film that you'll be seeing today, Hemmuktan, He Made It. Matt is founder of Ocean Culture Life and managing director of the Studio M. 
Um, Matt's really built a reputation as one of the UK's leading photographers and um, his, he has a real passion for, um, for purpose-driven storytelling and that work has taken him all over the world. He is also the personal photographer to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And I think you'll agree that Matt's delight in people and his surroundings is evident in his work. Will is an award-winning filmmaker with a passion for cinematography. His documentary, 152, about Goodwee's work and in honor of the 152 million children working in the world today premiered at the Liverpool Film Festival last year and was named Best Short Documentary by both the Oneiros and Latitude Film Awards. Will and Matt join us from the island of Jersey in the UK and they're going to, I believe Will will now introduce us to the film. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is um, Will Jack Robinson and I'm a filmmaker. This is a uh, shortened down version of the documentary that I've made called He Made It which will be released after this event. I remember while filming this, I really felt the weight of the story and it was really at times heartbreaking to capture. I was blown away by him. Despite his history and despite his past, he really had a positive outlook on life. He focuses on the, the future, which is important. He really cemented me the importance of story. In times like these, it's evident that a moment and a story can change everything. This is why I'm proud to tell him's story. And I'm sure I, I've, I've heard um, just before this event that Hem is actually in the audience, which makes this even more special. After this event, I encourage you to watch the full film, which is 15 minutes long, but I hope you enjoy this shortened down version, which is slightly more Zoom friendly. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> I was born in Makhwanpur district. It's a very remote area of Nepal. We were in a very poor condition economically, so we could not uh, survive. There was very shortage of everything, like uh, basic needs, uh, elect electricity, foods, education. These, those all things were you know, lacking at that place one villager from the same village uh, he was coming to Kathmandu to weave uh, in carpet factory uh, my parents decided to send me Kathmandu with that villager then I came Kathmandu uh, in a carpet factory and I started to weave in the carpet factory that carpet factory was very uh, worst part of my life I was lost in the dark, I was, you know, I had uh, lose all the possibilities of uh, hope of my life. I was young, I was small, and that uh, co-workers were very cruel to me, and in the factory, they had given me name. Fuchi in Nepali, Fuchi, that means uh, little boy. So at that time, I had no hope of life. Uh, some inspectors were there. I convinced my first I convinced my contractor and then uh, the owner factory owner this uh, this uh, this is impossible to uh, make decision here so please once let us go together. I think they convinced our father and contractor then they decided me to send in transit to so till the death, that was the happiest moment of my life. So from that time, from that day, I got new life. Uh, 
it was uh, quite uh, uncomfortable, like un- un- uncomfortable, uncomfortable because that place was new. Though my aim was anyhow I have to get the education. That was the main motto of my life. लग्न आड्डू भो भाई यहाँ आएर मैं सोचे कि अब तो धेरे पढ़ना आने होने अभी यहाँ मजस्ते धे एक दुई दिनसम अलग नरमाइल भो चीन जानी भैसम अभी ते पी एकदम खुशी भैस एक दुई दिन पीछे क्लास भे अलग यहाँ आए पे पढ़ना पाँदा अभी उ खुशी लगे अभी मैं यहाँ धेरे धेरे जो डांस र I have supported a lot of uh, children, and you know, uh, when I share my real story, they motivated. They got uh, motivated as I experienced, and you know, in addition to that, uh, yeah, I always uh, say them, please compare your life. How was your life in the past, and how is now, and how should make in the future? For that, you should make your goal of life. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. Um, I had some things to say, but I I'm going to start with this. When we were when we were on the ground, and when we were with that young girl, and we found out that she could sing, and we we got her to sing for us, I knew that was going to get me, and it she's got me again now, and I think it will get me every time because. I knew how I felt at that at that moment when she sung for us and her journey, her full journey that she'd been through. And I just remember sitting here, sitting there next to you, Will, and you know we we listened to her sing, and it really it really touched me. Um, just just the journey, just just really. I don't know. It's as a storyteller. I'm a storyteller, and I've been a storyteller for years, and. I'm going to start by saying I'm incredibly fortunate to have been part of this film and to have been working alongside、uh, Nina and Hem and the team of Goodweave and my team at the Studio M. We 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 share our work and we connect with people because we want to be able to, we want our work to be able to connect with individuals、um, individuals telling the to understand the story that these change makers the change makers are the people that devote their lives. On the ground, to protecting ch- young children or and protecting people all around the world, there are the change makers that we're devoting our time to now to be able to tell their story is incredibly. It makes us feel incredibly fortunate.、Um, I'm Matt Porteous. I'm、uh, the founder of the Studio M, and more recently, Change Makers. Um, stories are how we learn and how we inspire, change, educate, and help to make a difference. 
And I think that our journey with Goodweave over the last two years, and especially on this recent trip to Nepal, um, following on from that film that um, Will's just showing there, um, really um, resonates on on um, on how you know how lucky how lucky we are to be able to come to go out with Goodweave and share this story. And um, I would just like to thank everybody again, and I really look forward to you know, the next, the next 40 minutes, listening to these incredible voices. And then I, I ask you all to watch the whole film because it really is a very powerful film. And we continue to, we look forward to working with uh, Goodweave and the rest of the team over the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matt and Will, for your words. Um, the images and storytelling that really puts the world's children into the spotlight where they belong and especially now. So thank you so much. And you've had a lot of uh, inspiring comments coming in from the audience who were also really touched by the film, the music, by Hem's story. So thank you again. And um, before moving to the next part of our program, Will mentioned it. I did want to share that we have Hem Mukhtan in the audience tuning in from uh, Kathmandu. And um, I'm sure after watching the film, you'll agree that I'm quite fortunate to call him my colleague. And uh, thank you so much, Hem, for sharing your story, for your humanity, and for the work that you do. Okay, so we're going to be turning off the audience chat function now for the remainder of the program. As we invite you to focus on our panel of experts who will be speaking about the rapid changes in the world due to COVID-19, um, how that will impact child labor worldwide, and also to recommend strategies to protect children and workers. To moderate the discussion, we're very lucky to have Mr. Ian Rose. I first met Ian when he produced a film short by the BBC um, about some work of Goodweave in North India. Um, and Ian is a series producer and editor of multimedia projects for BBC World Service and BBC News. He's pioneered news gathering strategies for online social platforms and TV and radio and delivered global programming on youth unemployment, young female entrepreneurs, freedom, and the future, as well as social entrepreneurs in the de developing world. Um, Ian, thank you so much for being with us, and over to you. Thank you, Nina, and, and thank you for, for having me today. Um, we're joined by a global panel today of experts in this field. Um, Siddharth Kara is in Los Angeles. He's an author, an activist, and an academic fighting against child labor and for workers' rights. He lectures at Harvard and the University of California, Berkeley. We also have Manoj Bhatt, who's near Delhi and has for eight years been Goodweave's country program director, uh, again, fighting against child labor. And in Switzerland, we have Leslie Johnson from the Lords Foundation, a global foundation which hopes to inspire and change global industry uh, for, for less inequality and, and to inspire more environmentally friendly practices. So without further ado, Siddharth, can I come to you and ask you, we've seen this incredibly dramatic pandemic. We've seen villagers returning, workers returning to their villages on foot. Um, global change, what are you expecting are the big trends that will come out of, of, this, of these events? Yes, Ian. Uh, well, I don't need to tell anyone that COVID-19 uh, has been a massive destabilizing force uh, on the global economy. Uh, but what doesn't quite get the same amount of attention is that the, that destabilization impact is uh, significantly increased at the bottom end of the global economy in developing economies, the producer side of global supply chains. Uh, as Nina mentioned, in India, we've seen images of tens of thousands of migrants walking home by foot uh, once uh, factories were shut down because orders were suddenly truncated uh, and cut. Um, these are individuals who don't have a bank account, they don't have a savings, they return home without work, and in the near term, massive destabilization and increases of vulnerability, which will lead to um, 
higher rates of child labor, forced labor, individuals will have to take out loans in order to survive, and that will lead to exploitative debt bondage. Uh, going forward, either, even in the mid to longer term, once uh, hopefully the world gets back on its feet economically, uh, everything doesn't come back to the same on day one. Um, some of these people will uh, be employed again, probably for lower wages and worse conditions. But those who are not, uh, the first responders in a crisis are human traffickers. Uh, they will be in the villages, they will be looking to recruit uh, anyone and everyone, and particularly children, boys into forced labor, girls into forced prostitution. Uh, that is why it is so vital to have an organization like Goodweave with a strong ground team that is documenting what's happening, uh, that is apprised, uh, is helping with transparency uh, of conditions on the ground, and in a position to ameliorate uh, these severe, severe uh, increases in harm. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. We'll, we'll come back to you in a bit. But Leslie, if I could ask, ask you, what kind of trends have you seen from the industry uh, standpoint? How, how has this played out? Well, thank you, Ian, and i um, very honored to be here. I mean, as we know, this pandemic has completely upended the fashion industry um, and the global economy overall. In fact, a recent BCG study said that 30% of the industry will be wiped out in 2020. So it would be very tempting for industry to want to abandon sustainability, including their commitments for human rights, including commitments to eradicate child labor that's deep in their supply chains in order to get back to business as usual. But in my view, that would be a grave, grave mistake, largely because, as Siddharth very rightly said, we're not going to go back to business as usual. And in fashion, and I'm an optimist, I think there's going to be a lot of change. First, I think consumers will change. Already, we're seeing consumers are preferring those brands and retailers who are acting with integrity during this crisis, paying their furloughed employees, supporting their local communities. And in a post-COVID world, would consumers support companies that aren't doing enough to eradicate child labor? I really should hope not. And I hope that the reflection that consumers have had during this lockdown period will ultimately change their behavior and where they choose to put their dollars or euros. But secondly, I think brands and retailers will change. This pandemic has exposed the deep inequality and injustices in our system, which we see playing out right now as, 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 as we see in the US and, and globally with the Black Lives Matters protests. And borrowing from someone who inspires me greatly, Solitaire Townsend, I think the industry needs to ditch ESG in favor of what she calls ESJ, environmental and social justice, which should be founded on honesty, transparency, and inclusivity. And finally, if this happens, then supply chains have to change. And they have to change in a way where workers, currently those that have the weakest voice, but the most to lose, will have agency, and they'll be able to know and advocate for the rights. So I remain hopeful. Thank you, Leslie. We'll, we'll come back to you in a bit as well. But Manoj, near Delhi, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. What is it that you're actually seeing on the ground? Um, what, are the, what are the major things that, that you've seen happen? Thank you, Ian. Um, as Siddharth uh, mentioned, uh, the impact on the bottom of the supply chain is, is very, very uh, devastating. Um, for, to understand what kind of impact it has created, we'll have to understand who are these people at the bottom of the supply chain. In India, 84% and more than that, uh, people uh, are in the informal economy. That means they are not registered as workers. The government also doesn't know uh, how many workers are actually there. There is no uh, estimation of how many people are actually working as informal workers in the, in the, in the, at the bottom of the supply chain. So because of their invisibility, their wages are very low. They don't have any savings. Their social securities are not uh, met because they are not registered. So even one day's unemployment creates a huge impact on their life because they earn every day and they consume it. 
as they, they are. In last 20 years, because of the progress Indian economy has made, these people were able to somehow send their kids to school. Because the government has tried to make uh, education free, so th these people were able to do that. But because of the huge un unemployment in last almost three months, and the low demand in the, in the domestic as well as international market. What is going to happen is that the kids of these people, the children of these people, are going to see the same vicious cycle of illiteracy, child labor, and poverty. So unfortunately, this, this uh, pandemic uh, is going to uh, create a very, very negative impact on the progress of millions of children in India. Siddharth mentioned, Nina also mentioned that, you know, thousands of these workers, informal migrant workers. So the in informal workers are in broadly two categories. One is the home-based workers. They are in their community. The other one are the migrant workers. They have migrated from their villages to large cities to work and serve the, the domestic as well as global supply chain without actually any visibility as workers. So the migrant workers, when they realize that they are not going to get any employment for a longer period of time, they started moving back to their villages. And because the government also was not aware about the number of these people, so they were, they were, there was a huge chaos. These people walked miles and miles with their children, their, their older, uh, you know, uh, members of the family, some died on the way, uh, children got, uh, you know, hugely uh, sick, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was huge media coverage on, on the plight of these workers, which I see as a positive aspect of this whole episode. Because Goodweave, as an organization, we have been, like, trying to show everyone that there is a huge, uh, you know, bottom of the supply chain. And these, these, these uh, workers also need support and protection. After this, this crisis, the government, the NGOs, the media, everybody wondered who these people are and why they are moving back to their, their, their villages in, in huge numbers. Now these people have, you know, with huge struggle, they have reached uh, back to their villages where there is no employment. Um, the, the agriculture sector in India is all, already under huge pressure. Uh, what is going to happen, as Dark mentioned, what is going to happen is that, and the traffickers are also back in their villages. So this is a unique situation where the traffickers are going to get their victims right uh, in their, their own villages. And they are going, as soon as the, the, the industries start functioning, they are going to organize them in a way that they, they are, you know, taken to factories where, uh, you know, people are looking for very low wage workers. And as a result, huge uh, surge in child labor and forced labor is going to uh, be seen in, in, in the coming, coming days. The other thing I just wanted to briefly mention is that due to the low demand in the domestic as well as global uh, market and because we have in india we have millions of people who are unemployed there is going to be uh, pressure further pressure on the wages of these workers and as a result the families are going to engage their kids their children instead of sending them to, to school to work to earn even basic uh, you know uh, survival so this is unfortunate, which is going to happen. And there is a need for the government, for the NGOs, and for the industry to work together and make sure that, you know, the pandemic, once it is over, we have a new world. We have a new, uh, you know, business world with uh, better working conditions for everyone, rather than a worse situation like you know, forced labor and child labor. 
Thank you, Manoj. And it sounds like what you're seeing is actually some steps backwards. I just want to quickly tell our audience, if you've got any questions for the panel, please do send them into our Q&A and we'll put them to them shortly. But Siddharth, if I could come to you next. Um, Manoj was saying that what the, there's a lot of pressure for the uh, for the companies to, to relax their, their, their working standards. Um, is that something that we would typically see now? And we, oh, I think we're already seeing it in Uttar Pradesh where they've relaxed the laws for like three years. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, yeah, let's, let's take a step back for a moment here. We're in an extraordinary moment where the history of slavery and racial oppression across the North Atlantic world is having its day of reckoning. And I firmly believe that. Uh, and we have to remember in this moment that slavery is not just a historical phenomenon that has present day uh, legacies. Slavery continues to exist. The exploitation of uh, poor, uh, uh, lower uh, income individuals continues to exist around the world. Um, the only thing that protects, and it does exist for the following reason, rather than nation states, multinational corporations scour the world for cheaper labor to boost profits. It's the same formula as the slave formula was. Now, the only thing that protects these workers is regulation and transparency. And when you strip away regulation, law, protection, and transparency, as has just taken the place, as is just taking place in parts of India and in particular Uttar Pradesh, which with the complete stripping away of laws that protect around wages, hours of work, firing people, and so forth, you actually take us generations back to that old world of exploitation. It's as if India is making this announcement to the world, when you're back on your feet, we're open for business for cheap labor. So come here, we've got the cheap labor pool, don't worry about protections. This is taking us years, decades, even centuries back in mindset that there's this population of people who can be exploited for cheap labor to help boost profits of corporates and nation states. And that to me is just a glaring uh, 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 and potentially uh, deeply harmful development uh, taking place right now in response to the current conditions we're seeing with the pandemic. Thank you, Siddharth. Leslie, in, uh, in Europe, though, there, there is some hope, isn't there? I mean, before, the, uh, before the pandemic, we saw that there were policy decisions being taken that could have a global impact, but coming from Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And I fully agree with Siddharth that you need that regulation in place. And one hopeful piece of le legislation that we see coming on the horizon is the EU Mandatory Human Rights Due Diligence Bill which at the end of April, the European Commissioner for Justice announced that the, e the commission would propose legislation next year that requires those companies operating in the EU to prevent and reduce the risk of negative human rights and environmental impacts to workers in their supply chains. In other words, companies working in the EU would be legally on the hook for preventing child enforced labor in their supply chains. This is similar to what was passed in France a few years ago with the Duty of Vigilance Act. And in my view, this is huge because this means we move from what is largely soft laws or voluntary measures by companies trying to do the right thing to legal requirements that have teeth. This is changing the rules of the game for every company and its supply chain which is operating in the EU. So I'm very excited about it, although it will take time for this legislation to be drafted and approved. And it's also important to note though, that it's not a silver bullet. These new rules need to be clear and ambitious. We need to have incentives to follow the rules. Um, to, these need to be in place. We need to make sure that the reporting by companies is transparent and verified and mandatory. And we also need to see how other players such as investors can also step up and embrace this in their own way of working. But overall, this is a very bright light. Well, will it be about the main supply chain or will it be effective in the deeper supply chains? You know, I know from my work with Goodweave that a lot of what happens is in the informal economy. It isn't in the main supply chains. Do you think that that's something that this will address? And if it doesn't, should it? I hope so. I think we're coming into the moment where this will be designed. And I think if you look at how it's been done in France, for example, 
even formal companies may be tapping into informal supply chains. I mean, the work that we are currently funding with Goodweave is looking at the home working part of the supply chain that does feed into the formal fashion. Um, so I do hope and expect it to reach that deep. And hopefully that is a move that will be made in the next year when it's designed. Manoj, can I ask you what the impact closing schools have had on children, on what is actually happening with children at the moment? And are there new dangers which are arising as a result of the schools being closed and the children being at home? Yeah, Ian, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the children of, uh, uh, you know, informal workers, uh, daily wage earners. Um, as I mentioned, uh, most of them, uh, the children are, if they are in school, they are the first generation learners. Uh, there's no one at home to help them uh, with their literacy and uh, with their uh, learning process. Because the schools are closed. And unfortunately, in India, we are now seeing the virus spreading very rapidly in different parts of the country after the lockdown, unfortunately. And we are still uh, very far away from seeing the, the, the flattening of the curve. So that means the schools are going to remain closed for few more months in the country. And for these first generation learners where there is no one at home to support them, it's a long period of time to be away from the day-to-day -day learning. And they are already at risk uh, because their learning levels are very, very low. We work with thousands of such uh, children and we know they are far behind other kids uh, because of their circumstances. So there is a strong possibility that if the schools reopen after a few months, many of them would never go to school. And the families would also be tempted to engage them with work to earn, because the wages are going to be go down, uh, to earn basic living for the entire family. And it is possible that the, the girl child, the children who were, the girl children who are attending school, um, they may be, uh, asked to get married and the families may start, you know, marrying them early. So it is going to create a huge, uh, you know, downward pressure on everything, all kinds of progresses we were hoping for these very, very marginalized and poor uh, families. So this is going to be, if it happens this way, which looks very likely, it is going to be very, very unfortunate uh, and would take uh, these populations decades back in terms of their progress. Thank you, Manuel. Before I turn to the questions that have come in, Sita, can I ask you, what has history taught us? What, when, when these events happen, is there any kind of context that you could give us from history and, and lessons that we might learn in order to further the fight against child labor and the abuses of labor that we are fearing will happen? Well, history teaches us that catastrophes are not kind to the vulnerable. Um, uh, those who have a cushion, those who have safety nets in society, uh, those whose interests are important to governments, uh, uh, they, they of course uh, may suffer through catastrophe, but will be much more cared for and protected uh, than those who count less. And let's be frank, people at the bottom of global supply chains largely count less than those at the top. Uh, so catastrophe across, uh, across the centuries, uh, particularly those that lead to massive economic disruptions, um, uh, have a severe uh, and escalated exponentially negative impact on the vulnerable, often taking uh, one generation of progress and pushing it back uh, uh, several, se several generations. Uh, as Manoj mentioned, just when you start to get some, uh, the first generation of children in school, something like this strikes. Families are in uh, dire straits, uh, massive amounts of uh, debt, cannot survive. Uh, you have a choice, send a child to school or eat. Uh, and there's no choice there. There's no choice. 
Uh, and so that whole generation can be lost and then that cycle of vicious poverty will replicate itself. These are individuals who don't get uh, quantity, quantitative easing boosts from central banks to help boost their 401ks and, uh, and protect them. Uh, uh, they don't participate in the formal markets and banking sector and so forth. Um, uh, I, last thing I'll say, I just read that today we've had $3 trillion in the US of, of Fed spending. And I thought to myself, my God, what could that do if put into the hands of the poorest people of the world who eke out an existence on $2 a day? Uh, it's just, you can't compute it in your mind, but you would radically uplift just about everybody in the world out of extreme poverty. And if you add in European central bank spending, I mean, suddenly we would probably have no extreme poverty anywhere in the world, uh, but that's not the interest of the economy. And that's why catastrophes have a massively negative long-term impact on the poor. Yeah, maybe you know, people are thinking more radically now. Uh, I'd like to now just turn to some of the questions that our audience have been sending in. Um, um, this one I was going to uh, put to Leslie, it's from Frances Sherman. She says, will the EU mandatory HRDD put pressure on the US companies and eventually the government to follow this lead? Or will leakage and competition undermine, um, uh, undermine the EU? What do you think? Yeah, well, the legislation hasn't been drafted yet, um, but my hope would be yes. Um, but also keep in mind that this is relevant for any company operating in the EU. So there's plenty of US owned companies, North American owned companies in the EU. So this hopefully should set a standard of how a region can respond and create the rules of the game that in theory should lift all boats. Um, so I look to this as an example of how to do this right. And yes, I hope it does, well, first of all, you know, American companies will have to fall under it if they're operating the EU, but it also should serve as a shining example. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and oh, there's a question here, I think, for you, Sizhat, which is, um, uh, if we want to be, sorry, these, these are, are slightly changing as I, as, as I read them. Um, I'm so sorry. Manoj, can I ask you a question? And that is, what is being done in India to lobby against the relaxing of the labor laws? So uh, the good thing uh, in India in that context uh, was that uh, almost all labor unions uh, were against those, you know, relaxing of the legislation. Unfortunately, the labor union movement in India, particularly at the state level, is very, very uh, weak. The unions are stronger at the center, but not, I mean, we have, in India, we have a federal structure. So at the federal level, the, the unions are stronger, but at the state level, they are weak. Only in, in UP, for example, in Uttar Pradesh, only 15% workforce is unionized. Rest of 85% 85, 85 workforce is not unionized. So the, the civil society also came forward. The media also came forward to talk about, you know, the impact of uh, relaxations of these, these laws. And as a result, some of the steps the government has taken were taken back. Uh, like for example, the, the step related to uh, allowing higher uh, work day, uh, instead of eight hours, allowing 10 hours or 12 hours was, was taken back. Similarly, we are pretty sure keeping in mind the uh, protest, of the union, the Uttar Pradesh uh, government would uh, be forced to take the, the, uh, the steps back because still uh, a proposal which has gone to the, the president of India for signature. So uh, still uh, we are hopeful that the civil society unions uh, and the, the media would be able to influence 
the, the governing. Thank you, Manoj. Siddha, there are a few people who have asked this question and I'd, I'd like to ask it to you and that is, what can investors do? How can investors step up? Um, what have historically been the, the successful things that investors can do to pressure uh, companies to change their behavior? Well, I think there's no shortage of um, um, activities that activist investors in public companies uh, can undertake. I think getting engaged uh, with um, uh, the heads of companies and demanding the kinds of supply chain practices, transparency and protections that, that as Leslie mentioned, we'll hopefully uh, see coming in this legislation in the EU. Um, uh, it's not good enough to just have one web page on the company's website saying, we do these five things to ensure we don't have child labor in our supply chain. How about some independent auditing of uh, those efforts? How about doing that annually? Uh, how about investing in the communities uh, where you do source um, lower wage labor, helping to build schools, medical clinics, um, and so forth? How about setting some wage uh, floors uh, uh, so that even in the informal part of the uh, sector, uh, individuals are not working for 10 or 12 or 15 cents a day sewing buttons on the shirt, we, uh, sh uh, an hour, I should say. Uh, sewing buttons on our shirts. So activist investors of public companies, I think, can organize themselves and start getting active. I think we're in a right moment in history for them to do that and demand the types of things I mentioned and an array of other measures to clean up supply chains. Thank you. Le Leslie, I could see you nodding there. Um, Molly Goodman and Douglas Stewart both asked questions about this, so I'd love to know your thoughts as well. What is the role and what is the action investors can Yeah, fully agree with what Siddhar said. I, and I think what's, what's really important is that we need to make sure that the data is there so that investors can make the right decisions. And this is a challenge. Uh, because if you're actually investing in companies and all the sustainability data is self-reported by the companies, if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. And you don't really know if you're investing in a company or not. So I think that initiatives that increase data and transparency and therefore accountability are helpful for investors. So they make the right decisions. They're also helpful, and I saw another question here, for how are you sure that companies uh, that aren't doing the right things are clear so consumers can make the right choices. I mean, we have entities like Fashion Revolution that, that post an index that actually ranks companies by how well they're performing against different criteria. So data is critical, but I do want to stress again, investors are stepping up, but without regulation that actually makes these things mandatory, gives them teeth and moves us away from voluntary self-reporting, it's going to be hard. So regulation has to go hand in hand with that. Um, sorry, sorry. I was, I was muted. Uh, Manoj, I was asking a question from R. Peter Gupta, and that is, what will be the impact on women workers and the wage disparity that, that they face? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, um, the informal sector workers are broadly in two categories. One is, uh, the, you know, mostly male workers who have left their villages. They uh, have gone to the big cities um, to work, learn, and then again work. The second broader category is the home-based workers, and most of the home-based workers are women workers. And uh, the income they earn uh, is mostly invested, and there are studies to show that, that mostly invested on the betterment of their family particularly educating their kids, uh, educating the girl child, um, supporting uh, the adult, elderly in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the family. The impact of the current situation and the, the economic crisis created by the pandemic is that, that, that these, these women home-based workers are completely unemployed. The work is not reaching to them. And 
since the work is not reaching to them, they have nothing to uh, invest on their, their, their families. Again, it is going to create huge uh, impact on their, their, you know, their well-being, the education of the, the children, and uh, these women would be then forced to work in the agriculture sector where there is already huge, uh, you know, workforce half employed or very, you know, working on a very, very low wages. They might also go for, you know, uh, loans from uh, money lenders and which can then uh, create a generational debt on them. And then they may be forced to work uh, with, uh, along with their children to, you know, repay their, uh, you know, loan back when, when, when uh, they will uh, get work. The other, other uh, impact would be that whenever they get work, the wages are going to be very low. And because the wages would be very low, they would have to work long hours to earn basic living. And there is a huge uh, possibility that they engage their kids uh, in that work to survive. So the, the impact is, is very, very uh, negative as Siddharth mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the most uh, weakest uh, section of the society and the supply chain is going to hit the worst. Manoj, thank you. Leslie Johnson, thank you. Siddharth, thank you so much for your time. It seems that we are in an unprecedented moment and that the work of people like yourselves and Goodweave has never been more important. And Nina, if I could take it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ian and panelists, and um, we'll be moving towards closing. Thank you for all of your engagement from the audience and your incredible questions. We did not have time to get to each and every one, but I, um, a lot of the questions also were about what we can do both on the ground, in the marketplace, and um, we'll be sharing much more with you after this event in terms of what you can do. I hope that the, um, the powerful film that Studio M shared today and the, um, you know, the picture, the real humanitarian crisis on the ground for children that was painted for you today. I was really struck by Siddhar's use of language that the first responders are going to be child traffickers. They are child traffickers. We've already been reading about this. So we've got a, a serious, serious crisis on the ground. We also heard about some things we can be doing that investors can do, uh, that consumers can do. One thing that's really important is um, continuing to raise awareness. So I invite all of you today in honor of World Day Against Child Labor to get involved in this fight to end child labor. There are 152 million children and possibly many, many, many more as a result of this pandemic that depend on us for their freedom. If you're making purchases, um, please support the brands and retailers who have made child labor free production integral to their business. Many businesses are also struggling to survive the COVID-19 crisis. We heard about that as well. And this is a chance to support the ones that, um, that are really acting to stop child labor. On our website at goodweave.org, you'll find thousands of brands and retail outlets around the world where you can support these companies and the workers in their supply chain by selecting products with the Goodweave certification label. Um, I'm also pleased to share that in honor of World Day Against Child Labor 2020, Matt Porteous and Studio M have donated six very special photographic prints from um, their work with us um, on the ground in India and Nepal. And we have a silent auction that has just launched online. All proceeds are going directly to, um, to Goodweave's uh, Child and Worker Protection Fund in response to COVID. Um, and as a follow-up to this event, we'll be sharing a page, a campaign page on our website where you can learn more about the silent auction. Uh, I know Fiona asked where she's going to be able to see the film again, and many others may also be wondering that. We'll be um, sharing links with you. You can share um, that the short film and also the long version of the film, host screenings, please get involved. Um, and I hope that you're going to take these actions and many more this Friday, 
June 12th is the actual World Day Against Child Labor. So that's the day to take action. You can follow Goodweave's uh, social media uh, channels to uh, learn more and to have more information to share as well with your own uh, networks. Uh, so I really want to thank all of you who joined us today. Thank you so much, Studio M all of our speakers, um, and also our um, event partners and donors, Humanity United, um, Lottis Foundation, Skoll Foundation, and UBS Optimist Foundation. Um, we hope you enjoyed the film and the conversation. And again, please do stand with us in our mission to stop child labor in global supply chains. Thank you so much.